really stood to gain from it. Talked about why I believe Tony Soprano was killed in the last episode of The Sopranos. You'll find the... There is an opinion on the internet that the guy in the member's only jacket is Eugene's brother, who came to avenge his brother's death. In support of the theory, the author refers to the fact that the guy is like two drops of water, similar to Eugene. Even their jackets are the same. Also, we see the actor for the first time, which means that this is a deliberate move by David Chase. To emphasize the kinship of the man and Eugene, because we saw Eugene in exactly the same jacket when he performed the hit. It is also pointed out that Eugene's last name carries a secret meaning. Eugene's surname isn't a direct crow, but rather Crow Bridge, Ponte Corvo. In the broader context, Eugene, though a peripheral character, symbolizes not death itself, but serves as a conduit to it. While it's no secret that the first and last names of most of the Sopranos characters do carry hidden meanings, I strongly disagree with that theory, and here's why. The bond between Tony and Eugene traces back to their shared experiences in basketball during their formative years. Considering their long-standing friendship, it's reasonable to assume that Tony would be acquainted with Eugene's immediate family, including any siblings. If by chance, Eugene did have a brother, Tony's familiarity with him would be undeniable. In this hypothetical scenario, Tony would have unmistakably recognized Eugene's brother, engaging in conversation and extending heartfelt sympathies for the tragic loss of Eugene to suicide. We see here, however, that Soprano does notice the guy in the jacket, but loses all interest in him after a split second, further emphasizing that Tony sees him for the first time. As for the casting choice, the selection of that individual for the role of the members-only guy was a deliberate choice, tapping into the power of anonymity. Opting for an unfamiliar face was pivotal. Casting a well-known actor, even one with modest recognition, had the potential to shift the scene's entire dynamic. There's this intriguing theory circulating that posits Tony's demise in the finale as payback orchestrated by the Vipers, tracing back to the time he and Christopher brazenly pilfered cases of wine and, in a burst of recklessness, shot a member of the Vipers. Now, if the Vipers were indeed a bona fide one percenter outlaw motorcycle club, their arsenal and manpower could pose a genuine threat. The article also states, quote, if the Vipers indeed had Tony on their radar, the intricate dance between outlaw bikers and the mafia might come into play. Rather than resorting to a direct assault, they could leverage their connections in New York, possibly through one of the notorious five families, to navigate a resolution. This is bullshit! The mafia, a sprawling financial behemoth, intricately weaves its influence through clandestine connections with select government institutions, creating imperceptible strings that stretch back to the aftermath of World War II. If the mafia, capable of challenging entire governments, chose to intervene, could a mere biker gang withstand such a formidable force? Of course not. Jay Dobbins, in his landmark book, No Angel, explicitly described how wise guys treat bikers. In simple terms, they consider them to be nothing. Yes, of course, bikers are also a force. They have connections in law enforcement and their followers. But the mafia has much deeper roots. Think of Zellman. The politician is on the mafia's payroll. If they wanted to, they could force him to enact some legislation that would negatively affect the lives of bikers in Jersey. Okay, wise guys, now I'm having a hard time holding back my laughter, but I'll try nonetheless. Well, let's hear the facts supporting this theory. By the culmination of season six, Janice's report with Tony had plummeted to dire straits, particularly exacerbated by Bobby's tragic demise. The ongoing war with Phil, which ultimately claimed Bobby's life, further fueled Janice's resentment, laying blame squarely on Tony's doorstep. The infamous blowing roadies incident showcased Tony's disdain for Janice, a dynamic she endured, perhaps reluctantly, while Bobby remained in Tony's employ. Yet with Bobby's untimely death, Janice wasted no time in seeking out a new husband to alleviate her financial woes. Her pursuit of stability mirrored the same greed endemic to the world she inhabited. In the aftermath of Tony's hypothetical demise, she could envision herself maneuvering for a share of his inheritance. The final interaction between Janice and Tony resonated with an icy chill, as if the mere sight of him posed a profound challenge. Her aspirations of raising a family and shouldering the responsibility for Bobby's children added a layer of financial urgency, accentuating her relentless pursuit of security. While only scratching the surface of Janice's complex relationship with Tony in the concluding season, the narrative paints a compelling portrait of her motivations for wishing Tony's demise. 
So here's the puzzle. Mere days after the wrenching loss of her husband and receiving Tony's assurances of financial support from the Big Apple to assist her, she's allegedly orchestrating her brother's demise. What kind of twisted inheritance calculus is at play here? Is she planning to stake a claim to her brother's assets over his wife and children? The notion becomes even more baffling when you consider her track record of incessantly leeching off her brother throughout the series. It's a stretch to fathom that she suddenly sees a grander benefit in severing familial ties than continuing her familiar routine of dependence. Here's a compelling theory. The skepticism around the members-only guy as the shooter hinges on the question of how he could have known Tony's location at the restaurant. However, if we scrutinize Carmela's actions leading up to that moment, a different narrative unfolds. When Carmela informs AJ about their dinner plans, she casually mentions they're going out to eat. Later, when Tony inquires about the dinner agenda, she hints at Holston's, suggesting it was a collective decision rather than her individual choice. In the same scene, an interesting subplot emerges. Carmela perusing beach houses. While ostensibly for potential real estate ventures, a closer look hints at a deeper motive. The kids are now adults, and Carmela seems poised for a new chapter in her life. It's plausible that she subtly steered Tony into helping her establish a future independent of him. As she meticulously groomed this exit strategy, once she believed she had all the pieces in place, she orchestrated Tony's demise. Even if we set aside the absurdity of this theory, the question remains, why would Carmela want to kill Tony in front of their children? The murder of a father in front of the children would leave a huge trauma in the hearts of the kids, not to mention Anthony Jr., who had already been in a mental institution after a failed suicide. What do you think Anthony Jr. would do after what he saw? Of course he would follow the light at the end of the tunnel. Too bad there's no proper pool nearby. Now that we've established that this is nonsense, I suggest we look at the financial aspect. In other words, would Carmela really get the money if Tony died? Carmela finds herself in a stark predicament with Slava, and the prospect of extracting anything substantial from a Russian gangster seems implausible. While she's privy to the existence of overseas accounts, the notion of Carmela approaching Slava for a payout appears dubious. Even considering Tony's lawyer, Neil Mink, as a potential source, it's a stretch to envision him willingly parting with the entirety of Tony's assets. Any expectation of Tony's remaining crew members delivering cash to Carmela is met with resolute skepticism. The underworld's history is rife with instances where mobsters, despite pledging to support families, fall short in fulfilling these commitments when a member faces demise or incarceration. Tony himself, albeit reluctantly, attended to the widows within his crew, highlighting the rarity of such acts of benevolence in the world of organized crime. Carmela indeed had money, but not enough to support herself, a large mansion, and a suicidal son. I personally believe that Carmela loved Tony, or at the very least loved the life that Tony created for her. Killing Tony was a direct way to start selling Polish sausages paired with Sal's wife, if you know what I mean. For Carmela, it was the equivalent of hell on earth. Here's another interesting Sopranos theory cooked up under the influence of blood pressure medication. The individual strolling into Holston's, sporting a USA hat, bore an uncanny resemblance to Davy Scatino. The possibility arises that if Tony indeed met his demise in that diner, Scatino, harboring years of resentment, could have orchestrated the hit right then and there. But the thing is, Meadow Soprano makes a separate mention of Davy's fate. You might be interested to know that his father is now in a mental institution in Nevada. It's a haunting possibility that Davey might have taken his own life, succumbing to the weight of enduring so much pain. Imagine going through all that suffering only to find yourself isolated from your own family, left to navigate the abyss of loneliness. Although Davey could have been a cybernetic assassin from the future, so he could change his shell into a guy in a members-only jacket and then kill Tony. See, the theory makes sense. Consider this intriguing conspiracy theory. The puppet master pulling the strings behind Tony's demise is none other than Junior. While his advanced age renders him incapable of executing the hit physically, the theory posits that he masterfully orchestrated the entire operation. Why? Because Junior never truly forgave Tony for undermining his authority as boss and clandestinely steering the family's affairs behind his back. Despite outwardly appearing to let bygones be bygones, history teaches us that Junior is not one to forget or forgive such affronts. The theory gains traction by pointing to Junior's previous attempt on Tony's life, establishing a precedent for the deep-seated animosity between the two. 
Adding to the intrigue, there's the suspicion that Junior's dementia is a ruse. In a prior season, he openly admits to feigning mental decline to evade prison time. This revelation challenges the sincerity of his mental health struggles, introducing the possibility that he's playing a role to manipulate those around him. Delving into the enigmatic setting of the psychiatric unit, the theory posits that Junior wields more influence than meets the eye. Instances of other patients unwittingly carrying out his bidding, such as orchestrating a poker game, underscore his ability to exert control even from within the confines of the hospital. If you scrutinize the episode where Junior takes charge in the mental facility, orchestrating poker games with Candy, there's a nuanced portrayal of his mental state. Initially, he appears somewhat cognizant. You can detect subtle hints of memory loss, but nothing too outlandishly bizarre. The turning point occurs when his unhinged companion unleashes a brutal assault, delivering multiple fatal blows to Junior's head. The episode concludes with Junior, battered and staring into emptiness, his mental faculties seemingly unraveling. Junior's initial tumble down the stairs, catalyzed by a collision with a boom mic to the savage beating he endures in the psychiatric ward. The contention is that this relentless pummeling exponentially amplifies his dementia, transforming it from a manageable condition into an overwhelming affliction. The scene where Tony visits Junior in that room paints a vivid picture of the depth of his mental decline. The irony is palpable as Tony, once a subordinate, now takes on the role of reminding Junior of their shared mob history and the fact that Johnny and he once held the reins of power in Jersey. Even if Junior had plotted to take out Tony sitting in the confines of a mental institution, he'd forget about the plot after a couple minutes and ask for a scoop of ice cream. The possibility that the Russians play a clandestine role in the events of The Sopranos, particularly in the fate of Valerie during the episode where Polly and Chris get lost in the woods, adds an intriguing layer to the narrative speculation. In that specific episode, Valerie, a Russian mobster, goes missing after a violent encounter with Polly and Chris. The theory suggests that Valerie, if he survived the encounter, may have later informed Slava, a higher up in the Russian mob, about his ordeal. This could have prompted Slava to orchestrate a subtle retaliation, possibly manifesting in the mysterious figure appearing in the restaurant during the finale. The lack of explicit closure on Valerie's fate opens the door for speculation about potential repercussions. But the thing is, Chase at one point gave up on the idea of continuing the line with the Russians on The Sopranos. And in an interview, David revealed that the Russian was found by scouts who were on a camping trip and was sent back to Russia. Enter the Bella HD theory, a bold assertion that Tony Soprano met his demise in the final scene at the hands of none other than Furio. Throughout the series, subtle hints suggest that Tony harbors a cuckolding fetish, leading him to select Furio, the suave Italian, as his bull to cater to Carmela's desires. Now, you may wonder how this seemingly unconventional subplot ties into Tony's fate in the final scene. The connection lies in the fact that Furio, unlike several other characters, doesn't meet a grim end in The Sopranos, hinting at his continued existence. This theory postulates that Furio's survival opens the door for a spectacular twist. His return to the scene to enact Tony's demise, and perhaps more provocatively, to claim Carmela for himself. If I understand correctly, this theory is only based on the fact that Furio is alive and wanted to screw Carmela. Apparently, the author has a B on his hat. It could just as easily have been Anthony Jr.'s teacher that Carmela was having an affair with, or the same father, Phil. Why not? They're both alive, and they both wanted Carmela. Plus, the priest had a good motive. With Tony gone, he would have unlimited access to Zidi and watching his favorite movies on DVD. However, if you think that nothing more insane than this theory exists, you are sorely mistaken. The astute author of the theory, having traversed the series almost nine times, finds increasing credence in the notion that Meadow pulled the trigger. The theory marshals a series of intriguing facts to bolster its case. Meadow's uncharacteristic fumbling with parking becomes a pivotal piece of evidence, ostensibly stemming from the nerves associated with the weighty task of eliminating her own father. Adding an air of mystery, Meadow stands out as the sole character whose entrance into Holston's remains veiled from the audience's gaze, sparking speculation about her concealed intentions. The crux of the theory hinges on the moment Tony gazes upward, heralding the abrupt blackout. According to this line of thought, Meadow's entrance serves as the trigger, and the blackout symbolizes the exact instant she fires the fatal shot. Notably, her strategic parking choice, aligned with the door and conveniently poised for a swift escape, 
reinforces the theory's narrative. The deliberate selection of a parking spot, seemingly inconspicuous, takes on a chilling significance as it aligns with the theory's premise that Meadow orchestrated this clandestine act with calculated precision. The only way Meadow could have set Tony up was by telling Patrick Parisi about the restaurant where she and her family planned to meet. Patrick could have whispered to Patsy, but we'll talk about that later. Sorry guys, I can't believe that a loving daughter kills her father in front of the whole family. Although perhaps it was her revenge for the failed romance with Noah? Write what you think about it in the comments. Here's so-called allegorical fan theory. Dumbest the second, harboring a clandestine resentment and caution towards Tony, has been orchestrating a subtle vendetta since the moment his father expressed thinking of Tony as a son. According to this theory, Carmine Jr.'s move to employ Anthony Jr. in the last few episodes isn't just a strategic business decision. It's a calculated maneuver to neutralize any potential future vendetta from Tony's next of kin. By gaining AJ's trust and loyalty through a cushy job, Carmine Jr. effectively creates a buffer against possible retribution down the line. Very sacred and propane, isn't it? The theory proposes that AJ, in his perhaps naive or unintentional way, could have divulged information about his family's movements during dinner, unknowingly setting the stage for the impending hit. I highly doubt he possessed the requisite courage or garnered enough respect from the influential figures in the New York or Jersey areas to undertake such a perilous endeavor. Carmine was known for actively sidestepping conflicts, displaying a reluctance to disturb the proverbial beehive. The notion of him engaging in a risky venture seems implausible. After all, he strategically secured a handsome payoff from Johnny Sack to gracefully step away, augmenting his already substantial wealth. The risk-reward calculus wouldn't have justified stirring up trouble. His statement about retiring to ensure his survival and happiness resonates with credibility. If he harbored any ambitions for strategic maneuvers, the opportune time would have been when he held the backing to ascend to the position of boss. However, post-retirement, any such actions would have placed him squarely in the crosshairs of potential adversaries. Why jeopardize his safety and contentment by orchestrating a hit, especially on someone like Tony who was ostensibly in his corner? Who really killed Tony Soprano in the last episode? All right, now that we've sorted out the wildest theories, let's find out who really killed Tony Soprano. In short, I think New York ordered Tony's murder, which means the evil dwarf Butchie is behind it all. But such major changes in the mafia usually lead to wars and more bloodshed. Although everything can go smoothly in case the attacking party has certain arrangements with Tony Soprano's men, then the plan can be triggered. Therefore, I am pretty convinced that the plan to eliminate Tony Soprano involves major players on his own crew, namely Polly Walnuts and Patsy Parisi. Both have their own reasons for wanting Tony dead, but we'll come back to that a little later. In the meantime, we need to find out why the Lupertazis needed Tony dead so badly. I'd like to remind you that Butchie's personal dislike of Tony hasn't gone anywhere. Remember the episode when Butchie explicitly hints to Phil that bosses sometimes die, that it's been done before, and he's the one who brings up the idea of taking out Soprano. The pivotal moment unfolds when Butch makes the daring choice to defy Phil, a decision crystallized during their tense phone conversation while Butch traverses the streets from Little Italy to Chinatown. Phil's dissatisfaction with Butch casts ominous shadows, foretelling an impending sit-down that holds potential peril for Butch. I think that along with the idea of taking out Tony, the idea of getting rid of Phil and taking the cherished throne was planted in Butchie's mind. Then a plan formed in his mind, and Butchie gradually set about carrying it out. Initially, Butch sets the stage for a calculated confrontation by instigating Tony through Coco's harassment of Meadow at the bar. Tony's predictable reaction triggers Phil to unleash a vendetta against the Soprano crew. As Tony finds himself weakened and consumed by a thirst for revenge, the only viable recourse is to reluctantly engage in negotiations with New York. In a precarious alliance, they greenlight Phil's elimination in exchange for a temporary ceasefire. It's important to note that Butchie refuses to inform Tony of Phil's real whereabouts. So in the case of questioning by other mafia families, Butchie can easily deny his involvement in Phil's murder and get away with it. With Phil out of the picture, Butchie ascends as the new boss, liberated from the specter of retaliation during Phil's dwindling days. This strategic maneuver secures Butchie's position at the helm of power, orchestrating a transition that ostensibly brings peace to the chaotic mob landscape. It's crucial to note that when Butchie orchestrates Tony's demise in front of his family, it's not perceived as an act of avenging Phil. 
This ruthless move is more of a formality, a nod to the 101 mob rule of an eye for an eye. But why didn't the Lupertazis finish Tony off long before the events of season six? The answer lies in the show itself, and it is quite simple. The Soprano crew brought huge profits to the Mafia coffers, so killing the boss was not even considered. After all, the conflict with a high probability would have turned into a full mass war. And this would have meant not only huge losses in terms of human resources, but also huge losses in terms of revenue. And the Mafia is business in the first place. And money dictates absolutely everything there. But like I said, killing Tony would have been nearly impossible if some people on his crew hadn't helped the Lupertazis. First, the war was officially over, as cemented during Tony and Butchie's final meeting. The Sopranos and the Lupertazis shook hands. Imagine how the family from New York would look like if they murdered Tony after the peace that had just been made? However, if Tony had been killed by a stray bullet from an unknown cowboy, the blame could have been placed on anyone. This is a very popular scheme that we see many times throughout the show. Think of Chrissy and Sill's visit to the elderly Al Neri's house, or the hitman Ralphie encountered in the elevator. Or the most famous example, the unidentified black men who couldn't fight Tony. Sopranos only got bruises. Originally, the evening's agenda involved indulging in homemade manicotti. However, Carmela's time constraints derail the culinary plan. Carmela shifts gears and proposes Holston's as the unanimous dining choice. Tony cryptically mentions having to see some people when she informs him. The ambiguity surrounding Tony's supposed meeting with others raises intriguing questions. It's postulated that Tony, evasive about his plans, may not have actually convened with anyone else. I suggest that his vagueness serves to conceal a clandestine visit to the man who once nearly took his life, Uncle Junior. Notably, during Tony's visit to Uncle Junior, suffering from dementia in a care facility, the topic of Holston's never surfaces. These scenes, however, shed light on a pivotal detail. Holston's wasn't meticulously planned in advance. The lack of foresight suggests that only a select few individuals knew Tony's whereabouts that night. Usually, such operations are planned in advance, which means someone knew in advance what address to provide the killer with. Within the intricate tapestry of season six of The Sopranos, a notable connection emerges. Patsy's son, Patrick, is entangled in an engagement with Meadow. This familial link opens intriguing possibilities, suggesting that Patrick might have casually mentioned Holston's to his father. Equally plausible is the scenario where Meadow herself divulged details about her plans directly to Patsy. Delving into the intricacies of the Soprano family drama, it becomes evident that Patsy harbors motives for wanting Tony's demise. Despite Patsy's loyal contributions, Tony passed him over for the coveted capo position, a snub that simmered beneath the surface. The historical context deepens as we recall Parisi's earlier attempt on Tony's life, a vendetta fueled by the quest for retribution following his brother's tragic death. Yet, beneath these apparent motivations lies a less explored but crucial reason. Patsy's desire for Tony's demise emerges from a grim calculation regarding the fate of his youngest son, Jason Parisi. If Tony continued to breathe, Patsy's son would very likely be dead. Let me explain. In the final Sopranos episode, Patsy's concern for his son, Jason Parisi, becomes a focal point. When Pauly informs Tony that Jason Gervasi was arrested for selling drugs, Tony connects it to Carlo's disappearance. At a family dinner, Tony questions Jason Parisi's absence, suspecting his involvement in criminal activities. Jason Gervasi and Jason Parisi are two inseparable criminal accomplices. Patsy, realizing the danger, avoids discussing it. Tony's inquiries suggest a potential threat to Patsy's family, leading Patsy to believe he has no choice but to strike first to protect his son from Tony's retribution. Patsy's revenge unfolds as Patrick and Meadow's engagement integrates him into the Soprano family. This marriage positions him for leadership, seizing control in the void left by Tony's absence, and elevates his status in the Daimyo hierarchy. However, a logical question arises as how did New York manage to conspire with Patsy behind Tony's back since Parisi had no serious contacts. Well, here comes Polly Walnuts. As Tony's leadership wanes, Polly, once a trusted ally, suffers from paranoia about Tony's possible plan to kill him. A dream featuring Sal and flashbacks to his murder on Tony's boat heightened this fear. Polly, a savvy veteran, strategically leaks information to New York, possibly preparing for a shift in allegiance if New Jersey falters. Why did Tony think of killing Walnuts? 
As the tension mounts between Johnny Sack and the Jersey crew over a contentious Ginny Sack joke, Tony begins to suspect an internal leak feeding information to Johnny. Beyond the joke, there are indicators that Johnny has a well-placed source within the Soprano family, divulging details about sensitive matters like the housing project. In the episode, Remember When, during an informal dinner with non-mobsters, Pauly's loose lips unravel stories he shouldn't share. This intimate setting with Polly becomes a pivotal moment for Tony, revealing a concerning pattern of information leakage. Observing how easily Polly lets sensitive details slip, Tony contemplates the drastic measure of eliminating him. Moreover, the collaboration between Polly and Patsy while plotting at the Bing hints at a possible hit on Tony. Leveraging trust as John's trustworthy person, Polly negotiates with Butchie for a reshuffling of the family's post-war. Pauly envisions a leadership role for himself and Patsy in New Jersey with Butchie as boss in New York. With Tony eliminated, Pauly survives the tumultuous mob landscape. However, the price is high. A once admired relationship with Tony crumbles, revealing Pauly's ruthless readiness to sever even blood ties for personal gain. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to Vano VHS and hit the like button. And if you want to show some love to Vano VHS, you can now buy us a coffee. Check out the link on your screens.